Good evening and welcome to the inaugural Strucker Lecture on Christianity, Sexuality, and Gender. If you're a guest to Wheaton College, welcome. I'm glad you could join us this evening. If this topic is not just a theological discussion and it's part of your life, welcome. I'm glad you're here. My name is Mark Yarkos. I serve as the Dr. Arthur P. Reck and Mrs. Jean May Reck, Professor of Psychology here at Wheaton College. This academic theological discussion of sex difference is important. It's important for our own intellectual integrity. It's often through the exchange of differing ideas that we gain clarity about our own beliefs and learn to better understand those held by others. It's also important to witness the respectful exchange of ideas or what Richard Mao refers to as convicted civility, which is oftentimes missing in the current cultural context. So let me introduce then our speakers, Wesley Hill and Karen Keene. Wesley Hill is an Episcopal priest. He has spoken and lectured at numerous Christian colleges and seminaries in the United States and internationally. In 2018, he was a member of the St. Augustine seminar held at Lambeth Palace to prepare resources for the upcoming Lambeth Con Conference of the Anglican Communion. He's the author of Washed and Waiting, Paul and the Trinity, Spiritual Friendship, and the Lord's Prayer, a guide to praying our Father, to our Father. He is a contributing editor for Comment Magazine, and he writes regularly for Christianity Today, The Living Church, and other publications. Karen Keene is a biblical scholar, author, and spiritual care provider. She has taught biblical and theological studies in both academic and church settings. One of her primary research interests is scripture and ethics, including how we interpret the Bible for sexual ethics today. She's the author of Scripture, Ethics, and the Possibility of Same-Sex Relationship, and has a forthcoming book on the origins and interpretation of the Bible, both with Erdman's. Trained as a spiritual director in the Ignatian tradition, she also provides spiritual care through groups, classes, and retreats through the Redwood Center for Spiritual Care and Education. She earned her MS in Education from Western Oregon University, MA in Exegetical, Theology from Western Seminary, and THM in Biblical Studies from Duke Divinity School. Wesley and Karen will now each, in turn, present their views on whether sex difference is essential to a Christian definition of marriage. Each will have 30 minutes to offer their perspective. Um, we'll then sit down together on stage to enter into a time of q and a. It's really good to be back at Wheaton, my alma mater. It's wonderful to be with you uh, tonight. I also want to say thank you to my friend Karen, a longtime friend who I have great esteem for and great appreciation for, and it's an honor to be doing this with you, Karen. Thank you. I'd like to open with uh, a prayer that was not composed by me, but represents my hope for all of us as we think about what it means to uh, live as sexual creatures made in the image of God and being transformed into the image of our Lord Jesus. So would you please join me in prayer? Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you man and desire what you promise that among the most swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely bear the witness for true joys are coming now. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, there are a number of ways we could come at this question of the meaning of marriage and the question of whether sexual difference, the difference between male and female, is essential to the definition of marriage. I am choosing to come at the task tonight through the theology of St. Augustine of Hippo. Uh, one of the, uh, sorry, I, I need to pay attention to my own slides. I thought I might say something just before I begin about who your speaker is tonight. You've already heard my introduction, but uh, I, I am someone for whom, as Mark said, this conversation is uh, deeply personal. Um, it, it flows right out of my own uh, story, my own biography. I wrote this book a few years ago, uh, sort of a memoir trying to describe what it, what it felt like, what it feels like 
to be navigating questions of theology and biblical interpretation as a gay man myself. I followed it up uh, afterwards with um, a book trying to say, uh, so what? So if I identify as a quote unquote traditionalist on the question of marriage and sexuality, that only takes me so far. What, is, what does that mean for my future? What does that mean for my life in Christ? And so I ended up doing some work on hospitality and community and friendship. So that's a little bit about me. I now want to go to St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine uh, of Hippo, I think, gives us um, probably the most sophisticated account um, in Western Christian history of sexuality. I might think about that in light of the storyline of redemptive history. Augustine uh, is famous for trying to locate our understanding of sexuality within what we might call the meta-narrative of Scripture, the story of God's creation of the world as good, the story of the ruination of the world through sin and death, the story of God's intervention and reclaiming of his lost creation through our Lord Jesus Christ, and the promise and the hope of eternal life, the restoration of the cosmos. The question is, how do we think about our human sexuality in light of that story, if that is, in fact, the story that we all inhabit? So I want to try to unpack a bit of what Augustine says, and then at the end of my time, tease out maybe a few takeaways that I want to offer us uh, as a springboard for further reflection and conversation. And uh, what Karen has to say next will hopefully deepen and enrich our engagement uh, with these questions. So Augustine begins with an account of sexuality in creation before the fall. He wants to say that our being made male and female, our being made uh, capable of sexual relationships with one another is not an accident, it's not a product of evil, it's, it's the design of a good and gracious creator. He writes this in his commentary, the literal meaning of Genesis. If the question is asked for what purpose it was necessary for a helper to be made for the man, no more likely answer suggests itself than that it was for the sake of procreating children. Although you see it was when they had been turned out of paradise, Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, that they are reported to have come together and brought forth, I still cannot see what could have prevented their also being wedded with honor and bedded without spot or wrinkle in paradise, God granting this right to them if they lived faithfully in justice and served him obediently in holiness, so that without any restless fever of lust, without any labor and pain in childbirth, offspring would be brought forth from their sowing. It's interesting here that Augustine distinguishes himself from certain Greek fathers who suggest that the garments of skin that God makes for the primal pair as they are exiled from Eden, that those garments of skin refer to sexual difference being given to a previously undifferentiated humanity. Augustine doesn't go with that account. He wants to say that our being made male and female is originally good. It is not somehow a, a response to human rebellion or fallenness. <laughs> he also argues controversially that sexual desire prior to sin would have been governed by the will and not merely subject to the whims of lust. He says again in his book on the literal meaning of Genesis, why should we not suppose that before sin, those two human beings were able to control and command their genital organs for the procreation of children in the same way as their other limbs, which the soul moves for all kinds of action without any trouble or any sort of prurient itch for pleasure. I think this aspect of Augustine's thinking leaves a lot of us modern people cold but what he's trying to give some account for is the way we, we find, and I'll, I'll unpack this in a few moments, the way we find that our experience of sexuality today is often uh, out from our control in a way that causes us difficulty. Uh, there are aspects of that that seem uh, inextricable from the pleasure of sex as we know it now. 
But what Augustine wants us to recognize is that sex is at the same time the site or the location of so much human pain and misery. And he's trying to give some account of that. And he goes on in another work to talk about the institution of marriage, which he sees uh, there in Genesis 2. God creates the helper for the man, and the two come together in a one flesh relationship. And Augustine wants to offer uh, three goods, three benefits or blessings that he thinks are ingredient to the meaning of marriage. The first one is procreation. And he locates this right there in Genesis 1 with the blessing that is announced by God right after the creation of male and female, made in the image of God. The, the uh, blessing or the command in Genesis 1, 27 and 28 is be fruitful and multiply. One Augustinian commentator, Robert Song, says this, children do not appear here in this Genesis narrative as an optional extra to an otherwise self-contained nature of marriage. Rather, procreation is an inseparable and intrinsic good of marriage, the result of God's blessing and command to be fruitful. Children are not inserted into the partner's companionship from the outside by a wave of a wand, but are a blessing of God that arises from the heart of the relationship of male and female. A child is the entirely proper and fitting expression in the oneness of his or her flesh of the parent's own one flesh bond. So in this way, Augustine wants to say the coming together of male and female in marriage is for the good of the world. It perpetuates the human story, and he argues that it was essential to the growth of the people of God in the Old Covenant, because the growth of the people of God was not, as it is now in the age of the church, by conversion primarily. It was primarily by generation, procreation. The people of Israel are an ethnic people, and so Augustine sees procreation as being essential to that redemptive historical continuation of the story. He goes on, secondly, to say that exclusivity is essential to marriage, is the second good of marriage. In Genesis 2, 24, we read, a man clings to his wife. Augustine understood the marital bond to be designed by God to be a forsaking of all others and a cleaving of one spouse to another. Thirdly, he says, Marriage is about sacrament, or we might say permanence, or in more technical language, indissolubility. There is something about the coming together of male and female that is not only for the sake of the world, with the procreation of children, not only for the sake of the good of the spouses and their exclusive companionship and fidelity to one another, but marriage becomes something that God uses as a figure or a sign <laughs> of God's commitment to humanity, both in the Old Covenant as well as in the New Covenant. We read in the prophets of God taking up this, this figure or symbol of the union of two people, man and wife, to show Israel something of God's own fidelity to his people, probably most famously in the book of the Old Testament prophet Hosea. And of course, in the New Testament, the, the key text would be Ephesians 5 where Paul says explicitly that marriage is a mysterion in Greek, or sacrament in Latin. It is something that God uses to demonstrate Christ's laying down his life for his bride, the church. So in this way, Augustine says marriage is for the world, it's for the spouses, and it's ultimately for God. That's his vision of the creation and the goodness of marriage. But all of that, of course, becomes spoiled and distorted and, and disfigured and misdirected in light of human turning away from God, which we call the fall or the rebellion. Sexuality becomes a site that for Augustine vividly illustrates, it doesn't exhaust, but it vividly illustrates the ravages of sin and death in the human condition. He says this, this is in The City of God, his famous text, which includes basically all of his theology. 
He says, not even those who love this pleasure of sexual intercourse are roused either to marital intercourse or to impure and shameful acts strictly at their own will. Again, we might struggle with this aspect of Augustine's thinking, but what he wants to say is that the very, the very fact that we speak of sexual desire as overtaking us, we find ourselves caught up in lust, often against our will. For Augustine, that's just one vividly dramatic illustration of what is true of us across the board. We are not in control of our faculties in the way that we think we are. We are actually enslaved to desires that, that overwhelm us and and pull us along in their wake. Even so, he says, the Old Testament expectation as the story of God goes forward, as God dwells with his recalcitrant people, the, the expectation is that marriage in the Old Testament would be normative. Marriage and child rearing are expected. And it is how God forms the family of Abraham, the people of Israel, Genesis 15, one to six. And at the same time, singleness, and childlessness are generally in the Old Testament things that are lamented. Think of the lament of Hannah in 1 Samuel. Think of uh, Jeremiah's commission to be intentionally celibate. This, these are outliers in the Old Testament. These are not normative in the way that they eventually come to be uh, in, in the New Testament. And marriage in the Old Covenant is recognized as intelligible in the light of human mortality. I've always been struck by the way Jesus responds to the Sadducees in Luke chapter 20 when they come to him and they want to ask about whether there's a resurrection. Of course, they're trying to trap him because they don't believe in the resurrection. And he says to them, Luke 20, verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore. The reason the eschaton will not feature marriage is because the eschaton represents the defeat of death. And the implication then is that people marry now because there is death. There was actually a famous uh, patristic saying, which you find in John Chrysostom, you find in Tertullian, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, Athanasius, Jerome, it goes on and on. The saying was, where there is death, there is marriage. Uh, <laughs> because, because if there is no marriage, if there is no procreation, the story stops. Marriage and childbearing is necessary if the story of humanity is to go forward. But for Augustine, that is a feature of our fallen condition. And when the sons and daughters of this age attain to the resurrection of the dead, the practice of marriage as we know it will, will cease to be. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage because there is no need anymore. But now, in light of the resurrection of the dead, inaugurated through Jesus' resurrection, singleness is preferable. And Augustine is not unique in that. That's across the board in the, in the Christian early Christian tradition, singleness represents a kind of higher calling because it more directly witnesses to the resurrection. Those who voluntarily go without child, childless, those who voluntarily embrace childlessness are in a sense skipping the earthly parable of marriage and going straight for the eschatological fulfillment, seeking to demonstrate in their single childless existence a direct hope of being remembered by God, not necessarily by progeny, in the age to come. Again, Robert Song says, unlike the Old Covenant, in which membership of the chosen community was determined by shared ancestral blood, membership in the New Covenant community is determined by sharing the blood of Christ. Life in the community of the resurrection is life in which the hope of children is no longer intrinsic to the community's identity. Human flourishing has been given a profound reorientation. Full humanity, full participation in the image of God is possible without marriage, without procreation, indeed without being sexually active. Celibacy has become inappropriate 
we might even say, if we follow Augustine, the appropriate stance for those who wish to live in the new age. Now, where Augustine stands out against his patristic background is in wanting to say, but we must thematize marriage as a Christian vocation. We must give a Christian account of why people marry. And that is, he thinks, that uh, we see in Ephesians 5, this taking up of those original creative, creational three goods of marriage, and we see them being carried forward in the light of discipleship to Christ. So he offers, for the first time, really, in the patristic tradition, a full-orbed Christian defense of marriage as a holy practice of discipleship. He also, and I want to camp out on this for just a moment, I realize my time is running out, um, but he also wants to say that marriage, Christianly understood, is about the sanctifying of desire, not the indulging of desire. And this, I think, is something that we can hopefully, in Christ, all agree on, wherever we stand on the definition of marriage. I've, I've always been struck by this passage in Matthew 19, where Jesus is asked about divorce, and he, of course, gives a famously rigorous response, no divorce, divorce is not God's will because of your hardness of heart, that's why it was allowed in the Mosaic Law. And then he says in verse 9, Matthew 19, verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And the very next verse features the astonished, incredulous response of the disciples. They said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. In other words, Jesus, you are indicating that marriage is about holiness. Marriage is about the disciplining of wayward desires. Marriage is a call to devotion that is so rigorous that maybe we can't actually live up to it. And for Augustine, that indicates the nature of marriage, which is that it is about not simply having one's desires satisfied or ratified, but about having one's desires transformed as one gradually learns to lay down one's life for the, for the spouse. Well, that's, that's Augustine's basic account. I now want to try to briefly draw out some implications before um, Karen comes up to offer her uh, response. I think one of the things that Augustine offers us is a deep awareness of the intractability, the, the complicatedness, the lack of transparency that many of us experience with respect to our sexual desire. Augustine, more than anyone else in the patristic tradition, is alert to the, the entanglement of desire for sex with desire for power, desire for uh, mastery of another person. He's deeply aware of our inability to parse our desires much of the time. And this aspect of Augustine's uh, theology is, I would submit, something that all of us, again, wherever we stand on the issues, could take on board to recognize that the, the main Christian uh, calling for us is not simply the affirmation of sexual desire as we find it, but it's about submitting our love, submitting our, our desires to the crucible of divine transformation. Uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, wonderful um, Augustinians of our day is Eugene Rogers, who um, has written a, a uh, now sort of classic book called a Sexuality and the Christian Body, Their Way into the Triune God. He writes this, marriage is a bodily practice through which God enters the soul and disarms it with delight, lightening the load of impediments to love, as it embodied, hurries forward to something more and better for the body to mean. And then he points out, that if you look at the Orthodox tradition, 
Uh, martyrs' crowns are placed on the head of the spouses as they take their marriage vows. Because marriage is about ultimately laying down one's life. It's about asceticism. It's about saying, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, whatever life brings, I am going to keep at it with you. And Rogers goes on to say, marriage is for sanctification, a means by which God can bring a couple to himself by turning their limits to their good. And then he says, uh, sarcastically, he's arguing for the importance of same-sex marriage. He says, no conservative I know has seriously argued that same-sex couples need sanctification any less than opposite-sex couples do, uh, which is meant to elicit a laugh, I think. Um, so uh, uh, the, next, the next Augustinian that I want to mention uh, tonight is Sarah Coakley. Many of you will know her, her work. Uh, it's been widely discussed. Uh, the first volume of her systematic theology, God, Sexuality, and the Self, has argued that we need to be thinking about sexual desire not as something static and fixed that we either endorse or deny, but as something that is capable of being offered to God and being reordered by God's primal desire for us. So she says, the supposedly fixed, fallen differences of worldly gender are transfigured precisely by the interruptive activity of the Holy Spirit drawing gender into Trinitarian purgation and transformation. Coakley, like Rogers, is affirming of same-sex marriage, but I am struck primarily by how different her account sounds from many popular accounts with which we're all familiar. She's not simply talking about affirming desire as it exists presently. She's talking about entering into a transformative relationship with God, where one's desires are, are laid bare, and one finds the Holy Spirit wooing us and beckoning us into a deeper life of prayer and self-abandonment to God's transforming love. These are the kinds of, quote-unquote, affirming arguments that I think Augustine would recognize, and that I think are more recognizably Christian than what we sometimes encounter. Finally, I want to mention my friend Eve Tushnet on the so-called non-affirming side. Eve has been building up a body of work over several years now, essentially arguing that uh, the conservative churches uh, and the conservative theologies, like the one I'm offering tonight, have, have too often left people with a sense of what they're called to say no to without any corresponding sense of what we are called to say yes to. And she has come up with a, a brilliantly memorable line, you can't have a vocation of no. You can't build your life around something that you're saying no to. You have to embrace a sense of purpose and calling. You're being ushered into a life of discipleship in God's kingdom. And any account that we offer of the transformation of sexual desire in celibacy and abstinence from gay sex has to not simply leave people with a command to refrain from something, but it has to beckon us into a life of hospitality and community and friendship and discipleship in which we too, those of us who are celibate, can find our desires purgatively transformed and drawn into the Trinitarian life of God. Eve's new book, Tenderness, is one of the most beautiful books I've read in recent years, and it's one of the books that's given me hope. Because this book is not focused primarily on exegesis of the same tired proof texts. It's not focused primarily on the dangers of uh, queer political movements. It's focused on the very mundane and very poignant question of how then shall we live? What are the practices, what are the forms of life that the churches can commend to gay Christians like me that would woo us deeper, draw us deeper into the life of God in Christ. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I am so grateful to be here. I am grateful that you
you took the time to be here, and I especially thank those who made it possible for this uh, forum to happen. Um, Wes and I have been wanting to do something like this for a while, for a few years. We've been talking about doing a public forum to have not so much a debate, but a dialogue, a um, iron sharpened iron conversation to help the church go deeper and think more deeply about these issues. Uh, Wes and I have many things in common that we agree on. We both believe that the Bible is uh, the word of God, the inspired word of God. We both believe that uh, sex belongs in the content of marriage. Uh, we both believe that uh, being a Christian and a follower of Christ involves sacrifice. And so I think it's helpful, as even though we come from different places on this, there's much that we also have in common. It's going to be impossible for me to um, unpack everything I want to share, so I'm going to try to talk fast in this short time and provide some of my own thoughts on this. Um, so, just let me give some context for why we're even talking about sex difference. Uh, both. On both sides of the debate, scholars agree that the biblical authors condemn the same-sex relations. And scholars on both sides of the debate also agree that the predominant forms of same-sex relations in antiquity were exploitative, pederasty, masters raping slaves, prostitution. So uh, traditionalist Preston Sprinkle, who's also a New Testament scholar, gives their consensus. We do have some evidence of pure same-sex relations, but these seem to be rare. For the most part, same-sex relations followed the, uh, followed the dominant versus dominated social paradigm. Most same-sex erotic relations in the Greco-Roman world exhibited some sort of power differential. That is, there was the dominant partner and the dominated partner, the master and the slave, the man and the boy, the guy seeking homosexual sex, and the male prostitute who gives it to him for a price. One question in this discussion is what kind of same-sex relations are the biblical authors condemning? Are they referring only to exploitative practices, or are they also referring to a universal prohibition on the basis of male-female complementarity? The prohibition passages themselves don't give a lot of information. They don't. Uh, uh, they don't give a lot of information. They don't tell us detail. So, for example, some biblical uh, translators have wrestled with what certain passages mean. Martin Luther, when he translated uh, the Bible into German in the 16th century, when he read uh, Leviticus 18:22. He read it as, you shall not lie with boys as with women. In other words, pederasty. When he translates the word arsenopoitai in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10, he translates it as boy molesters. The NIV translation today translates the same word in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy as men who have sex with men. So did Paul mean pederasty in the advice list, or did he mean consensual relations between adult men? We could also read the NIV translation as referring to prostitution, which is, uh, could, could occur between adults and could be something that was by consent. Does Romans 1 describe godless heterosexual gone wild with lust for novel sex? as John Chrysostom and much of tradition interpreted Romans 1? Or does this passage refer to the effects of the fall and the 13-year-old boy in the Sunday school class who's starting to realize he's attracted to the same sex and he's terrified, as many traditionally now read Romans 1? Those who oppose same-sex relationships fill in the gaps uh, by using Genesis as an intertextual lens to argue for a universal prohibition based on male-female complementarity. And those who affirm same-sex relations uh, fill in the gaps with what we know about the context in the Greco-Roman world, that most same-sex relations were exploitative. 
neither those who oppose same-sex relationships or those who affirm them can prove on the basis of the prohibition packages alone uh, their particular side of the case. So they bring in additional information to fill in the gaps. In my own process of studying this, uh, I was not able to come to an affirming position on the basis of the exploitative argument. It's a, it's a credible argument, and it may very well be the reality that all of the passages that refer to this in scripture are pertaining to exploitation. But I couldn't, I couldn't prove that that was the only reason that they condemned it. And uh, I, I, so I, I needed something more for myself. And my process be, uh, for becoming affirming was actually somewhat accidental. Um, as I began to study scripture more, I, I noticed how the biblical authors in Jesus were um, engaging with scriptural mandates. Um, Jesus and the biblical author do not blindly apply scriptural law. They engage in a deliberative process to determine if and how a mandate applies. In other words, circumstances matter for discerning what to do with a biblical mandate. So Sabbath observance and permanency of marriage are creation ordinances, but exceptions were ba uh, granted based on human need. Jesus allowed divorce in the case of adultery, and Paul allowed divorce in the case of abandonment. In the same way, Jesus objected to the legalistic enforcement of the Sabbath, Humanitarian needs matter when considering how we apply scripture for ethics. Even if you believe that male and female is a creation ordinance for marriage, it's necessary to engage in a deliberative process for appropriating ethics from scripture. Now, I don't have time to go into more of the deliberative process, but I wrote a book uh, about that, um, scripture, ethics, and the possibility of same-sex relationships. If you want to learn more about uh, the idea of the deliberative process when we're looking at law and applying scripture. The problem with a rule book approach to the Bible is it often leads to proof texting, pulling individual verses out of context and divorced from a broader canonical theology. A handful of proof texts on same-sex relations are plucked out of the Bible and blindly applied across the board. This is the same interpretive method that slaveholders used to argue against the abolition of slavery. They could, in fact, easily point to numerous texts in the Bible, including biblical law, to support slavery. The biblical authors don't explicitly argue for full abolition. They could make a plain sense reading and argument from the text. In contrast, those who opposed slavery, uh, opposed slavery had a much harder time making an exegetical argument. They had to appeal to broader themes of liberation in the Bible. And yet that is precisely what the slaveholders were missing. Good interpretation of scripture will draw from the big picture. Despite laws and customs in the Bible that sanction slavery, we see a broader salvation story unfolding where God works to liberate those in captivity. A rule book hermeneutic misses the forest for the trees. Sanctioning slavery misses the canonical vision of liberation. I would argue that a rule book hermeneutic has characterized the discussion of same-sex relationships. Prohibiting all same-sex relationships misses the canonical vision of marriage. Increasingly, both those who oppose same-sex relationships and those who affirm them recognize that the debate is not won on the basis of proof texting the prohibition passages but rather requires a broader theological understanding of what marriage is. And that's why we're having a forum answering the question, is sex difference essential to marriage? 
So to discern whether sex difference is essential to marriage, we need to ask, what is marriage? It's important to keep in mind uh, the distinction between the purpose of marriage versus the goods of marriage. Scripture describes the purpose of marriage as covenanted kinship of mutual support, and the goods of marriage as procreation, stewardship, uh, stewardship of sexual desire, and sanctification. Marriage can exist, for example, without procreation, which is a good of marriage, but marriage cannot exist without a covenant. And, that, and so covenant is foundational to the purpose of marriage. In Genesis 2, we have the first mention of marriage. Then a man said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Marriage is when a person leaves mother and father for the purpose of creating a new kinship unit. Two previously unrelated people come together in one flesh. One flesh is kinship language. This is like saying marriage makes two people flesh and blood. This language of bone and flesh is common in the Old Testament to refer to kinship, such as when Laban says to his nephew, you certainly are my bone and flesh. Often the conversation on same-sex relationships, it's reductionistically, uh, re it, it's, it's reduced to the idea of the sex drive and sex act. But what God had given us is a familial drive. A familial drive compels us to leave mother and father and create one's <coughs> own household. Not a temporary household, but a home defined by a new kinship relationship. Marriage takes us from family of origin to the establishment of our own family. And a covenant is what establishes a marriage, while the sexual act symbolically bonds the couple as flesh and blood. God's marriage to Israel and Christ's marriage to the church are important for understanding the purpose of marriage. The imagery of new household is used to describe God's relationship to humanity. God takes us as kin and makes a home with us. So we see in the Sinai marital covenant, God states, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And the eschatological wedding in Revelation is described this way. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the home of God, is among the people, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, his kin, and God himself will be among them. Marriage with God means that God sets up house with us. Marriage is home. And this marital kinship is meant to be characterized by mutual support. As Genesis 2 says, a spouse is to be an Asia. God said to uh, Adam in the garden, it is not good for the human being to be alone. I will make an ally corresponding to him. When God says this, Adam is not actually alone. God is with him, the animals are with him, keeping him company. But God and the animals are too different, too other for Adam. The human, need, the human being needs someone similar to be his Asia. The word Asia is often translated helper, but more, off, more accurately means strong ally. In scripture, it is used to describe the way God rescues Israel, not the help of a weaker subordinate. Genesis 2 says Adam needs an ally who corresponds to him. Connecto is a compound word meaning corresponding to. 
It's a picture of two people standing in front of each other, mirroring each other. Similarity. Contrary to how it's often interpreted, it does not mean opposites as in opposites attract, as in difference, but rather correspondence. There are only two places in the Bible where this compound, connecto, occurs. They are both in Genesis 2. The first occasion is in Genesis 2.18. God sees that Adam is alone and needs somebody corresponding to him because God and the animals are too different. The other reference is in verse 20, when Adam looks among all the existing animals and can't find another creature that corresponds to him. And the Greek translation of the Old Testament from the third century BC, the translator uses the word homoios in verse 20 to render the Hebrew compound connecto. This Greek word means same or similar. So the translator understood Adam as not being able to find someone similar to himself among the animals. He needed another human being. So, so far we have seen that marriage is leaving one's family of origin to create a new covenant kinship unit. And a spouse is to be an heir, a strong ally. We are often taught that Eve is an heir, but not that Adam is also an heir. Yet Adam was looking for someone like himself, another human being. And God said it is not good for the human being to be alone. So it would not have been good for Eve to be alone either. Adam and Eve correspond to each other, and so they are allies to each other. In marriage, a spouse is meant to be the one who faithfully had your back through life. The foundational purpose of marriage is covenanted kinship of mutual support. The imagery of God married to Israel and Christ's marriage to the church reinforces an understanding of marriage as covenant and dwelling together in household, a familial home. Let's turn now to the goods of marriage. So the purpose of marriage is covenant <coughs> the kinship of mutual support. The goods of marriage are procreation, stewardship of sexual desire, and sanctification. Genesis 1 states, that God created sex difference, male and female, for the blessing of procreation. So God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Overwhelmingly, Christian tradition has understood the purpose of sex difference to be procreation. It's what we share in common with the animals who are also created male and female. In Genesis 1, we see the same fertility blessing for animals as for human beings. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. A new theology that has become very popular lately um, claims that sex difference is a reflection of the image of God. And this is actually a very new theology that was uh, promoted by Karl Barth and uh, Pope John Paul II. But the notion that we uh, reflect the image of God through sex difference is not supported by scripture. And that connection is explicitly denied throughout Christian tradition. Genesis 1 and Christian tradition connect the purpose of sex difference with procreation. And having children will normally be, be part of creating a new family unit. But procreation is not required to validate a marriage, nor do offspring make a marriage. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read the story of Elkanah and Hannah. Hannah was infertile, but Elkanah says to her, Am I not better to you than ten sons? In other words, is, my, is not my relationship to you as husband 10 times more significant than any offspring? Marriage is valid without the ability to procreate, but marriage is not possible without covenant kinship. 
In the biblical portrayal of God's marriage to Israel and Christ's marriage to the church, we see that the marital relationship itself, by itself, defines a marriage. Procreation is a good of marriage, but it's not the foundational purpose of marriage. We also see sexual uh, stewardship is part of a good of marriage. But because of sexual immorality, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own <coughs> husband. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer, and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Marriage provides a channel for stewarding our sexual desires in a Christ-like way. And here's an important point. Christian tradition has consistently held that lifelong celibacy is not possible for every person. Even the church fathers who thought that celibacy was superior to marriage admitted that it was not possible for everyone. Marriage is was considered and is still considered a necessity for many people to steward their sexuality well. Scripture also says sanctification is a good of marriage. Marriage helped us to become more like Christ as we learn to self-sacrificially love our spouse. Ephesians 5 describes sanctification in marriage as part of a broader conformity to Christ that all Christians participate in, whether we're married or not. So it's important to read Ephesians 5 in context. And we see at the very beginning of Ephesians 5, it said, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And the same exhortation is then reiterated in this passage for husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are part of his <laughs> body. <coughs> Sanctification is key to understanding God's marriage to Israel and Christ's marriage to the church. God's marriage to us sanctifies. So at the marital covenant at Sinai, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me, to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The new covenant. For this is the covenant which I make, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And it's within this context that we read in Ephesians 5, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church and all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she would be holy, but that she would be holy and blameless. Christian marriage is a sign pointing us to salvation. In Ephesians 5, Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, which refers to a husband and wife becoming one flesh. He uses this analogy to picture Christ's oneness with the church. 
Christian marriage witnesses to the mystical oneness of Christ in the church. And this oneness results in regeneration. We become the body of Christ. We are crucified, buried, and resurrected with Christ. So a Christian couple's self-sacrificial love and not sex difference is what witnesses to the sanctifying effect of Christ's oneness with the church. In other words, Christian marriage is a witness by its Christ-likeness. That looks like caring for your spouse uh, as if their body is your very own body, just as Christ cares for the church, his body. To summarize, a canonical vision of marriage indicates both a foundational purpose of marriage and goods of marriage. Covenanted kinship of mutual support is the foundational purpose of marriage, while the goods of marriage are procreation, sexual stewardship, and sanctification. Now, procreation is uh, an area where Wes and I probably have a, a bigger disagreement. He sees pro procreative intent as inextricably connected to marriage. Well, I see it as a good of marriage, but not as inextricably connected. Traditionalists often draw their definition of marriage from Augustine's three goods of marriage, procreation, uh, permanence, and fidelity. Of these three, only the procreative aspect is not feasible for the same-sex couple. And by the way, we're talking about people who are not able to function in heterosexual relationships. Uh, we're talking about people who are looking to be in a same-sex marriage because they want to create a family, not because they're just trying to be novel in their sexual relationships. We're talking about family for people. So, uh, procreation and Augustine. Augustine viewed procreation not merely as a good feature of marriage, but in many respects, the purpose of marriage. And Augustine was very helpful with the church. Prior to Augustine, the church was starting to veer off into some uh, bad theology. Uh, there were prominent theologians that were saying things like the sex difference is the result of the fall, that marriage and procreation is really not all that great. It's just something that God graciously offered because sin had entered the world and therefore death had entered the world. And so God created procreation so that life could be perpetuated. Some like Jerome were even saying that marital sex is sinful. So into that landscape, Augustine comes in and says, hey, no, uh, marital sex can be good, marriage can be good, procreation is good, and that sex difference is not the result of the fall. But, Augustine did not entirely escape the negative influence that, that was around him uh, concerning sex. He absorbed some of that. His views on procreation demonstrate that he still feels a certain degree of discomfort with sexual relations even within marriage. Augustine believed that procreation is what justifies marital sex. Whereas I would say Genesis 1 indicates procreation is a blessing stemming from marital sex. And this is a very important distinct nuance here. While Augustine was able to see that marital sex is not sinful, he only considered sex to be blameless if it was for procreation. He did not believe it was acceptable for a husband and wife to have sex simply for the purpose of intimacy and enjoyment of each other. He believed every sex act needed to be open to the possibility of procreation because procreative potential is the very thing that essentially sanitizes the act. In fact, Augustine invented a new term for sin, venial sin, 
to characterize marital sex that is not for procreation. Venial sin is not as bad as mortal sin, but it's still a fault. Augustine believed it's a weakness for a couple to desire sex simply to enjoy one another. So he said, it is however one thing for married people to have intercourse only for the wish to beget children, which is not sinful. It is another thing for them to desire carnal pleasure and cohabitation, but with the spouse only, which involves venial sin. <coughs> Procreation was inextricably tied to marriage because Augustine needed it to justify marital sex. This is why the Catholic Church, which heavily relies on Augustine, prohibits the use of procreation, prohibits a husband from having an orgasm outside the vagina. All sex acts must be quote unquote genital to genital and capable of being open to procreation. That means if a woman has a medical condition that causes excruciating uh, pain during vaginal sex, the married couple is not allowed to engage in alternative forms of sex. It also means that people with disabilities or injuries who are unable to perform penetrative sex are prohibited from marrying at all. Now, Augustine and the Catholic Church will allow infertile couples to marry, but the reason for that is because and fertile couples were are hypothetically considered to have the potential for fertility because maybe God will do a miracle. So as long as the couple is open to the miracle, the marital sex is acceptable. But this sidesteps the reality that infertile couples are not going to have children and their marriages and their sex life are based on something other than procreative potential. Procreation became inextricably tied to marriage because of the influence of Augustine, who believed that procreation was necessary to justify marital sex. But that is not what we see in scripture. Scripture validates sexual pleasure as good apart from procreative intent. For example, Song of Songs. Genesis 1 indicates that procreation is a blessing stemming from marital sex, not a justification for marital sex. I want to leave you with um, one last thought. When Genesis refers to male and female, this should not be understood in a wooden proof texting way to deny that some people experience an atypical sexual development. The fact that intersex people or those with same-sex orientations are not mentioned uh, doesn't mean those realities don't exist or that they are the re result of the fall. We might consider John Calvin's understanding of Genesis. He recognized that the description of creation in Genesis 1 did not always comport with what the science of his day knew to be true about the universe. And he explained this discrepancy by saying, Moses wrote in a popular style of things, which without instruction, all ordinary persons and dudes with common sense are able to understand. Because he was ordained a teacher as well of the unlearned and rude as of the learned, he could not otherwise fulfill his office than by descending to this grosser method of instruction. Had he spoken of things generally unknown, the uneducated might have pleaded an excuse that such subjects were beyond their capacity he only proposes things which lie open before our eyes, our, our, our eyes, i.e. visible to the naked eye. So Calvin believed that the writer of Genesis describes what is visible to the naked eye 
not necessarily all that there is to be said. In the same way, it can be said that Genesis 1 conveys a simple understanding of sex difference that reflects what most people observe with the naked eye. Discussion of neurobiology, chromosomes, hormones, internal sex organs, and other intricate and invisible aspects of sexual development would not have been comprehensible to an ancient Israelite audience. The purpose of Genesis 1 is not to provide a theological treatise on sexual development, but to simply praise the creator who speaks so many things into being and blesses that life to overflow in abundance. Thank you. <coughs> We're going to just go ahead and start this kind of a more conversational tone, but we're just going to um, just invite you, if each of you could just take a few minutes to respond to one another's uh, presentation, I think that would be where we'll start. Well, first of all, thank you, Karen. Uh, it's really an honor to be doing this with you as, as we talked earlier. Um, Karen is uh, a friend of many years and someone I greatly respect, um, so thank you. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Um, thank you for a very rich presentation. There's so many questions that it generates for me. Um, maybe I'll just I'll just pick one or two uh, and and sort of rip on them. I think that um, so one of the one of the books that has made a big impact in evangelical conversations around sexuality in recent years is William Webb's book Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals, um, and part of that book, I, I take it you would you would resonate with. I mean, your your book is very much about how do we recognize trajectories in scripture? How how do ethical guidelines get revised in light of the living of human life? And um, how does the Bible not represent? I, I really very much agree. It's not a static rule book. It's not like a car repair manual where we look up for you know, timeless commands. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gradually historically unfolding collection of documents that we believe God speaks through. Um, but of course, one of the arguments that Webb makes is we see uh, with slavery, there's a kind of, um, there's a mixed witness in scripture. There, there, is, uh, there are efforts to mitigate the inhumane uh, dimensions of slavery. There are, um, Instances in the New Testament of the New Testament really bucking the trend of, of you know Greco-Roman society and in some of the ways it talks about slavery. Um, same thing with the with the role of women. Um, uh, there's a kind of gradual unfolding, but of course he argues that that we don't see that same kind of unfolding with sexuality. That there's a uh, there's there's this um, kind of in, in contrast to Greco-Roman culture, which was more permissive around same-sex sexual behavior. The New Testament is, of course, famously prohibited. So I just, I wonder if you could maybe reflect on that a bit and how, how there are maybe different versions of the trajectory kind of argument and understanding and how that might, how that, how, how you might differentiate your view from, from someone like Webb's. Yeah, that's actually an excellent question. Um, just to a point of clarification, I don't see my book so much as trajectory uh, as, deliberation and that's a little bit different so trajectory is going beyond what scripture says yeah. and i actually had a professor in seminary who discouraged us from reading william Webb's books because it went beyond scripture i don't agree with that but um yeah. but but yeah the, uh my book is dealing more with a legal deliberation or ethical deliberation process as a, as a hermeneutical principle for how we engage with scripture. And that's also kind of the point I was making about slaveholder hermeneutics. So there's the abolitionist hermeneutic where I think you can see that trajectory. But the concern I have and that I'm raising as a point of consideration is something has gone wrong with the slaveholder hermeneutic and that they could make a very good plain sense argument 
uh, you can make a very good plain sense argument for slavery from scripture. And that, but that's a problem. I mean, that, that that's not right. And so I guess I'm cautioning about the fact that you can take uh, an exegetical argument. Uh, that's kind of more my point. And it's the same case with, you know, um, the early church where they were um, saying things about, you know, sex difference being the result of the fall or something. It's, it, why did they say that? Well, because there's no description of sexual intercourse until Genesis 4. Well, that's the plain meaning right there. there there's no sex happening until Genesis 4, until after the fall, it must be the result. Doesn't the psalmist say, I was conceived in iniquity? My mother conceived me in iniquity. Obviously, the plain sense meaning of that is that there's something sinful about the whole process of conception and having sex. Or uh, scripture says that uh, we're going to be like the angels. That's obviously the plain sense meaning is that there is no sex difference in the eschaton and sex difference is not significant. Um, and you could say the same thing. It says right there, it says male and female in Genesis. That's the plain meaning. Um, I think that what I'm suggesting is that there's a possibility that the debate on same-sex relationship had resorted to some of these kinds of taking, uh, I guess, a wooden kind of interpretation where I, I guess you could make a literal interpretation that that's what it means, but that I think that it's missing the heart of the of, of some, a bigger picture. And, and for me, the question is, what is marriage? And what is scripture saying that marriage is about? And it's about this familial drive and the fact that we all, most of us have this impulse to leave mother and father to form our own families. And so the, at some point, the opposition to same-sex relationships stopped making sense because it sounded like, well, if you can't procreate, then you can't have any of it. But what about, what about all the, all, what about the value of covenant? I, I guess in supporting same-sex relationships, marriage in particular, now what I am doing is, yes, covenant is good. Yes, the sanctification in, in the marriage relationship is good. Yes, stewarding our sexual desires is good. And why would we prevent participation in the, the wonderful thing because I, I can't do one piece of this. So that's kind of a long way to answer, I'm sorry, but. No, 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 thank you. Um, this, is, this is maybe perhaps a, a bit more specific question. So um, you, you, I think you mentioned James Brownson at one point. Uh, he's written a, a, another book like Webb's that's been widely discussed in evangelical circles, Bible, gender, sexuality. And one of the main arguments in that book, which I think you also um, kind of repeated tonight, is that when we look at the end of Genesis 2 and this language of bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, that's language that is not limited to the spousal relationship in the Old Testament. Uh, you, you mentioned Laban. Um, uh, this is kinship language that is, is not uh, exclusive to this male and female marriage. Um, and therefore, uh, marriage need not be uh, exclusively male and female. I mean, I think you and Brownson would say predominantly it is because you know most people are are not um, same sex attracted. But I, I I I continue to feel that that I agree with that that it is kinship language. But I think that you also have a note of distinction there in that same passage. So. There's the, there's the play on words in the Hebrew of ish and isha. You know, she shall be called woman, isha, because she was taken from man, ish. So there's, I agree that the language of bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh is stressing sameness and likeness. And of course, you're exactly right. The 
hamoi, hamoyas in, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That doesn't mean, um, you know, kind of, uh, it's, it's not stressing the, the uh, distance between the man and woman. It's the, it's the similarity of the man and woman, unlike their dissimilarity with the animals. So therefore they're able to, to enter into this covenant. But it seems to me that it's, it's, it's a mistake to completely remove the emphasis on, on difference there. It's, it's, it's both sameness and difference. It's, it's the man recognizes at last there's someone like me, the sameness, but she's also importantly different than me. Uh, she was, she's not a, a reduplication. She's taken from the, from the man. And I think it's, it's for that reason, among other reasons, that I just, I continue to feel that that kind of stress on sameness, while it's true, it actually neglects other features of the text. So I wonder, I wonder if you might respond to that. Yeah, um, I am definitely not someone who would try to deconstruct sex difference. I'm not, I'm not somebody who would say, oh, there's no, there's male and female doesn't matter. Um, my argument is not no or yes, but it's yes and. So yes, there's this difference. Yes, that difference is good. I, I, male and female is wonderful. And uh, procreation that, that comes from that is wonderful. And there's more to be said. There's more to the story. I think along the line that John Calvin was yeah. kind of indicating in, in Genesis 1. So I'm concerned that uh, we might read Genesis in ways that are a little bit too wooden. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess my, my exegetical question would be, so the, the conclusion is drawn from the stress on sameness and difference, both sameness and difference. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. So it seems as if both the sameness and the difference are ingredient to the, the covenant of marriage. I mean, this is why, for example, someone like Robert Song, who I know you and I both talked about, he, he wants to argue for same-sex covenanted relationships. He is affirming in that sense. But he doesn't want to call them marriage, I think for these kinds of exegetical reasons, because he wants to say, there's, there's something about the definition of marriage that requires not only similarity, but also this distinction. Yeah, and the, some of the things I disagree with with Song is that part of his argument is that he falls into the fallacy that, he, that sex differences are a reflection of the Imago Dei, mm -hmm. of, of the image of God, which is a prob very problematic reading. Um, but also, um, I think that he sees procreation as inextricably connected to marriage because of the uh, Augustinian influence that I think is problematic. Um, with, with regard to the therefore, that Hebrew construction, it would be des descriptive rather than prescriptive. So as I understand it, and I'm drawing this from an article by Robert Kissel, um, the uh, imperfect verb form in the narrative. The verb is describing something that happens to be customary or habitual, uh, what is typical, but not something that is, pre you know, uh, a, a prescription. So, do I get to ask? Can I get sure. to ask? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, you no, know, there wasn't a lot that I disagreed with in your presentation. I think there, your presentation brings out a lot of commonalities that I have with you, you know, particularly seeing um, marriage as a place where we can be conformed to greater Christ-likeness. Um, I definitely agree with you in regard to, um, you know, ordering the ordering of sexual desire and, um, you know, not just affirming everything that we feel. Uh, so there's so much that I agree with that there's not a lot that I would be like. The only thing that I think, I think the biggest difference is in regards to procreation. And I, and I, I think that some of Augustine's rationale around procreation and how that got so inextricably connected is problematic. 
uh, as a justification for marital sex rather than procreation being a blessing stemming from marital yeah. sex. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I very much feel that we have a lot of common ground, so I, I appreciate, I appreciate, I think it's really important to note that in a conversation like this. There's, there's a lot of shared commitments that we have. Um, I'm less comfortable saying that Augustine is sort of driven by, I mean, one of, one of the common ways of, I think, um, kind of dismissing Augustine is to say, well, this is a guy who is, uh, you know, just has this overwhelmingly powerful sex drive and he's psychologically disturbed by it. And so he has to construct this, you know, elaborate system that, that allows him to live at peace with his conscience. I mean, I, I would, I would want to point to the exegetical moves he makes. And I mean, he's very drawn to the fact that as soon as humanity is described as made male and female in the image of God, there's the procreative, you know, mandate or blessing. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not just that he's sort of making up that connection. He's, he's locating it in a feature of the text. And we might say, you know, that there were particular psychological reasons for him being perhaps drawn to that text. But, um, I mean, Jesus himself foregrounds that text. You know, when he's asked about divorce and marriage, he, he says, well, have you not read that from the beginning, God made them male and female? So I... Um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not happy to, and I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying you're doing this, but I'm not happy to dismiss Augustine's arguments about procreation as if they don't have an exegetical basis. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and I would encourage people to read yeah, Augustine absolutely. and and sort through some of those. I think that those would be great conversation. In regard to the reference you just made of Jesus referring to male and female, I think it's important to understand the context of why he's saying that. So, in the context of our debate, it it there's a tendency to read anachronistically. We read it. We read in to the text something that's not there. So we think that Jesus is trying to make a statement about sex difference, which really would, doesn't make any sense. It would be like me going up to John Wayne and saying, John Wayne, you are male and not female. And he would be like, what, what the, are you stupid? Of course I'm male. Um, and that, and, that, and the, the same thing would be true for Jesus going up to the Pharisees and saying, do you know that marriage is male and female? And they would look at him and go, what the hell is the matter with you? I'm uh, 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 So we have to look at why he is, why is he referring to male and female? So the question that the Pharisees are asking are about divorce and, it, it, and his opinion about what Moses says about allowing divorce and Jesus uses a shorthand at a scripture reference to refer to Genesis. So in, in antiquity, it was common to maybe say the first line of something or, or say a, 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 a line from a, a chapter or something like that to reference it. So for example, when Jesus is on the cross and he says, you know, why have you forsaken me? He, making a reference to the psalm. And so Jesus is throwing out this line, in the beginning God made the male and female as a reference back to Genesis, because his point is Genesis has precedence over Mosaic law. The, Phar the Pharisees are saying, this is what Moses says, and Jesus is saying, well, going back to the beginning, this is, marriage was supposed to be permanent. Right. And so Genesis takes precedence over Mosaic. And that's his point. I think that's important to understand that context that he's not trying to, he's not self-consciously making a statement about sex difference and the way that we're trying to infuse meaning into that passage. Yep. Great. Okay, so um, in a lot of these discussions, uh, you get questions that are for kind of both of you. Uh, we don't have that as much. It's for like, here's a question for David, here's a question for, for Wes. So, um, but either, you can definitely uh, both reflect on it, but this is for, uh, for Karen. Uh, in, in your understanding of marriage as covenantal kinship, uh, of mutual support, 
Um, how does this marital relationship then differ from a familial bond? But what actually makes marriage distinct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, the first thing would be that marriage is bringing together two unrelated people. So it's different from a, a relative because you are related by birth um, as opposed to marriage, which is, is creating a kinship, a kinship bond between two people who are unrelated. And obviously, um, the sexual relationship makes it distinct from, say, friendship, for example. Uh, we see this with couples who are infertile. Um, the basis of their relationship is covenanted kinship of mutual support and their value and meaning in the marriage on that basis uh, alone. It's, a, it's also the um, creating household. So I've lived in intentional community, uh, which is a wonderful uh, thing. Um, there's different ways of, of uh, connecting and, and, and living with people, but marriage is creating a specific kind of household, a family commitment that is, is for life. Um, so I don't really see any real difference between an infertile heterosexual couple and the basis of their marriage and a same-sex couple. Um, for Wesley, um, how do you interpret the implications of the Augustinian good of reproduction for infertile heterosexual married couples, assuming they're entirely um, sure that biological children are impossible for them? Do you, do you agree with the Catholic interpretation? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so I'm not Roman Catholic, that's the first thing to say. Um, and I, I, I do think there is, so there, there's a broad consensus among what we might call classical Protestants that procreation, while it is uh, ingredient in the definition of marriage, it is not necessary for each individual marital sex act to be open to procreation. So Paul Ramsey is a, an Augustinian who's made this argument that, that while Christian marriage should remain open to children, contraception is under, circum under certain circumstances legit, legitimate. Um, and I think some of those would have been the kinds of, the kinds of uh, things you mentioned, Karen, in your, in your talk. Um, one, one argument that the Catholic Church does make, which I, I am still wrestling with, and I, I, think I, I think I find it compelling, is that for even, even infertile couples are still, um, I think this is the language that the Catholic Church uses, they, they are still structurally open to procreation. So they're, they're, there's, a, there's a bodily, um, complementarity that remains even if there are extenuating factors that prevent conception from taking place. So they, in, in, their, in their suffered absence of children, they still bear witness to the fact that marriage is for the sake of having children, for the sake of welcoming children in the world. Um, so, you know, I mean, the Catholic Church will marry uh, couples who are past the age of childbearing, for example, for this reason. Um, so I, I think I think one can still see this as as part of what marriage is for, the the, the purpose of marriage, without without <laughs> negating the fact that there are couples for whom this this remains impossible. Um, yeah, I don't know how satisfactory that is, but that's, that's my understanding. So, so kind of along those lines, but for, for Karen, um, uh, there are a couple questions kind of along these lines, but um, I wonder if you could comment on why then does the biology not naturally allow for procreation in a same-sex relationship when that is extremely important 
just for life to continue um, regardless if procreation is needed in marriage. Um, so I think it's, it seems to be more about there not being the allowance of procreation biologically in a same sex relationship. Um, I'm not negating the good of male and female. I'm not negating the good of procreation. I'm not um, saying that the, that's not a wonderful reality. Yeah. And most people on the planet are going to do that. And um, my argument again is, and there's more to the story. There is we know more about sexual development, that there are um, uh, intersex people, for example. Um, and so uh, just the fact that there are some people that are not going to be able to biologically do that, I don't think is a reason to prohibit them from creating and forming a family, a forming household. So for Wesley, um, so there are questions on whether just, is remaining, delicately, is remaining celibate enough? Should, um, should a Christian pray for more than celibacy, for a transformation? Um, and I think the assumption is towards heterosexuality. So a lot of my work is in some degree of reaction to uh, distancing myself from dominant approaches in the evangelical world in the last few decades. Um, uh, the so-called ex-gay movement has been a very, I think, mainstream in evangelical Christianity for a, a long time. And um, if you follow that movement, you know that a lot of people invested a lot of their lives seeking to be delivered from same-sex attraction and <coughs> failed to experience the hope for change. And uh, there have been a lot of critiques about a kind of a version of the prosperity gospel, that if one is sincere enough or prays diligently enough that to quote one of the most famous organizations, change is possible. Um, and uh, I think that message, um, it, it didn't grapple with both the, the lived reality of a lot of participants, but also aspects of the biblical witness that talk about um, sort of prayers for deliverance that go unanswered. Um, I mean, most famously, of course, Jesus in Gethsemane, um, but also, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you know, three times, which is a biblical idiom for many times. Many times I prayed for this thorn <laughs> in the flesh, whatever it was, you know, some sort of eye condition, probably, uh, to be removed. And the answer is no. Uh, the Lord Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And um, I, I started doing more research and found that um, you know, many, many Christians from fairly recent past history did not operate with this kind of ex-gay paradigm. Um, C.S. Lewis is, is in print saying, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't think change is the way to think about this, uh, moving toward a heterosexual orientation. Francis Schaeffer, uh, major evangelical voice, same thing. Um, Greg, Greg Johnson is an author that's demonstrated a lot of this in a recent book. Uh, he's written called Still Time to Care. Um, so I think, I think a lot of my efforts in my writing and speaking has been to say, so um, for those who have prayed for it, longed for it, hoped for it, sought it through counseling or therapy or what have you, healing prayer, and have not experienced this, this change, um, and who are unable for reasons of conscience to enter into a same-sex marriage, what do we say? Um, and uh, it turns out that there is a lot in the Christian tradition about what it looks like to embrace a life of celibacy. There is a lot in the Christian tradition about uh, committed, non-sexual friendship um, that is even kind of adorned with the language of kinship. 
Uh, some of these pairs of friends talk about wedded brotherhood, sort of mixing the metaphor of kinship and marriage to talk about it. So, um, you know, I, what I sometimes say to people is I, I fully expect to be gay until the day I die, but God can do whatever he wants. I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling God not, not to do something, but I, I think that it's, I, I think it's highly unlikely. And I think there are, I mean, we know of other conditions, um, congenital disabilities that, that we don't, it would, we, we recognize it would be cruel to say to someone, you know, God wants to heal you. God, God wants you to pray to be delivered of this because it, it just does not seem to be God's intention to do that given the, given the historical and biological realities. So um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be limiting what God can do, but I also want to be reading both the book of scripture as well as the book of nature and trying to come up with um, a way of thinking about these things that's more humane than I think was often the case in the XK movement. So, um, Karen, um, there was some surprise about you that saying that the early church uh, didn't think celibacy was possible for everyone. Um, and you seem to affirm that as an argument for same-sex marriage. Um, yet many Christians who did not want celibacy are in positions of celibacy, wanting to marry and never marrying, or being widowed, or being divorced, and so on. So why is a call to celibacy any different for a straight Christian than for a gay Christian? Yeah, good question. So, yeah, just to reiterate, it's it, uh, across Christian tradition, uh, it, celibacy has always been seen as something that not everyone can do. Uh, Martin Luther, I mean, that was the case all along, but then you get to the Reformation, and boy, it really, it's like, you know, the Westminster Confession says that even making a vow of celibacy is sin. Uh, uh, and I don't, I don't obviously don't believe that, but um, there's no evidence that lifelong celibacy is possible for every person. Um, scripture, you know, Paul and Jesus both point to that in my interpretation when Paul says if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. Um, the Christian tradition interprets Paul that way as well. Social scientific studies that uh, you know, look at people who sign pledges, uh, chastity pledges, can hold out maybe statistically about 18 months longer before um, engaging in non-marital sex. Conservative evangelicals recognize this. Uh, you know, Al Mohler, and um, you can read articles in Christianity Today that encourage early marriage in full recognition that prolonged chastity is not feasible for most people. And that is true, not just for people who are attracted to the same sex, but also people who are straight. I think straight, pe straight single people are having great difficulty uh, <laughs> living out celibacy as well. Um, so I don't think anybody is, I, don't, I think there's a lot of problems with, with uh, whether you're gay or straight, living that out. And we have a very strange epidemic of singleness in our culture, which is a whole nother conversation um, that I think that there's some root issues that need to be addressed there. Uh, I mean, even just, um, you know, I, in the early 1900s, only 7% of people lived alone, and now it's skyrocketed up to like 25% of people in the United States are living alone. So there's a, there's a bigger, bigger, much bigger problem that is creating, I think, a, a, a situation where people are in prolonged singleness and chastity, and I don't think any, I don't think very many people, gay or straight, are successfully living that out. Um, uh, I do think that there's a difference between not having anybody in front of you 
you know, you just haven't, you haven't happened to find the right person, but maybe you're still dating and you can enjoy dating and you can, and, and can hope for, oh, maybe I'll, I'll meet somebody and that reality versus you're sitting right in front of the person that you love and that you want nothing more than to marry and build a, a family with and you have to say no. It's not hard to say no when there's nobody there. <laughs> it's excruciating to say no when that person is right there. I mean, how many people could fall in love with somebody and want to dream of a family with that person and just say no? It's a, it's a difference psychologically between <coughs> hap you happen to be single and making a vow of celibacy and knowing that you're never gonna have the opportunity to date or experience any of the intimacy of that. You're never gonna be able to marry. I mean, the, the psychology of that is very different. Um, you know, the average age that people know that they're attracted to the same sex is 10, 11 years old. And the, the psychological burden of of realizing, oh wow, this is, I may never be able to get married or, or have a family. I may never be able to date. Uh, so I don't consider those, I, I see a distinction there. There's a distinction between, oh, I just haven't found somebody and you're prohibited from even considering dating or marriage. So um, we're scheduled to um, have our dialogue until 8.45, so we're gonna wrap up our time together. We have a lot of questions we didn't get to, but we're gonna um, have a, sh a brief reception in the lobby of Barrows, so we welcome you all to join us and to um, ask any other questions you have or connect with uh, Wesley and, and Karen. But can we just thank them for modeling for